G'day and welcome to Market Sam After Work. Um, today I have a few things I want to go through um, and I suppose I'll start with what's smack in front of me, um, some different cartridges. What this is actually referring to is the um, build or supporters um, help to build different chamberings or different rifles or, um, or test different cartridges. Um, so what we've come up with, uh, I've previously introduced it, suggested um, that it was a way that I could see that we could that you guys could help us in the channel and particular individuals, so uh, whether that's, that's 10 or 15 individuals um, sponsor the channel or sponsor that cartridge by putting in X amount of money, which helps us get the, right, get the barrel, um, get the brass, get the loading dies, get it chambered, get everything done, put it into gear we already have, so put it into actions and chassis we already have. Um, but there still is a, for us, a, Fifteen hundred to three thousand dollar cost, depending on what uh, what setup we're talking about, to go through and actually test them at ELR, at ELR, go through and do some load development, make it all work, make it all work well, so that you can see how they perform the different cartridges, um, see how they um, for the people who put um, invest some money to help us do it, they get some of the more of the information than the normal channel will get, although the normal channel, everyone will get a certain amount of it. But when it comes to load details and some of the specifics with the loading dies we use, the brass we used, all that sort of stuff in the final levels, the, it, that is for the people who put the money into it. Um, the main thing we're really after and really looking for is the support so we can go and do this, so it isn't all coming out of our own pockets, uh, where we just simply don't have enough funds to do that. We've sort of pushed our boundaries as far as we can, so it's actually helped to do that side of things. So, what I've come up with, um, there was several, or lots and lots of um, cartridges that were mentioned, chamberings that were mentioned. Um, and we then narrowed it down to a few, which I now have listed. Um, so I've actually put them in as, and this is, to keep in mind, this is just the first offering, the first taking. Um, and I really hope that this works and we can go, whether that's six monthly or that's yearly or whatever it is, go through and do another two or three or four, whatever actually works. Um, and that also means if there's a, something comes up where people really want to see it and there's enough people want to get on board, then we, that can be done through the comment side of things or email, whichever do, we can put it forward and put those suggestions on there, let people know so that then we can get that support. Now the last detail I've gone through in doing this before I tell you how the process is going to happen um, is that we're just after help. We're not trying to make it, when I really think about it, to try and make it where I set X amount of money and try and get that target um, and then um, only on that level can we make it happen, um, I think has some snow, has some problems to it. How do I pass on that information of exactly how much extra we need? How do we organise that? So that gets a little complicated. So really what I've sat down is a process of we're still going to be putting X amount of our money into it. And I suppose that also means when we get general channel support, so whether people are donating to us or um, have set up by PayPal or whatever they do in, in the way of gift or donations or whatever it is to actually help us run the channel and do what we do and help us get a little bit of money for, for what we do, um, that sort of money will also go into this to fill up the gaps. So what am I saying? That means that Ultimately, if we have a 2,500 Australian dollars, so that's around 1,500 US dollars, um, is the real budget we've got to put in to make this happen in basically get brass, get it loaded, get it happened, get you know 100 shots out of the thing. Our real budget to get to that place is a is 2,500, 20, uh, two and a half thousand Australian. Um, then if we can get to where we've got 1800 or 2000 or something like that to where we've got the majority of it, the 75% of it actually paid for in this process, then our pockets will be involved to go that next step and get to that place. And that makes it more feasible to be able to get to that place without having to try and um, do it solely on the support network. So that's the process we've gone to, which leads it down to our discretion a little bit, how much we can put into it, or our discretion and our budget as to what we can actually make it happen. But it makes it a little more feasible, I think, to actually go forward. So how do we do that? How are we going to do that? Well, if you go onto our web store, if you go onto the support page, you'll see there the listed calibers at the moment. And on there, you'll see the prices. There's uh, of what we're after for one person's support. So what you're talking about and whether you're talking about the 
um, $150, which is $150 Australian. When you look at it, it'll be in whatever country you, you come from or whatever you've dialed in, it will show up for you. For US, I think that's just under $100. And then there's the bigger ones at 220 Australian, which comes into, I think, around just under $150 US. Um, and obviously different for wherever you are, you, where the, whether it's Euro or it's RAN or it's wherever it is, it'll be factored into the, the exchange rate is done through the web store. Um, and keep in mind, when you go to check out, it'll go back to the Australian dollar figure. It'll show the Australian dollar figure. That doesn't mean it's going to all of a sudden charge you a, if it was, if it was um, 150 Australian dollars, which is just under 100 US dollars, when you go to check out, it'll say 150 Australian dollars. That doesn't mean it's going to charge you 150 US dollars. It means it's going to charge you 150 Australian dollars. It's an unfortunate feature of how their site works, which is what we're using, which is, um, which is Shopify, uh, which is where our store is on. But don't be troubled by that. That is, that is still going to be the US dollars you saw. Um, it's just converted the, 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 the currency. That's why the numbers changed. So that's what will actually happen. Um, and once you've um, done that, we will go through and like I said, when we get to a number that we can make it happen with, then we will go with that. If people want to buy that later on and want to buy more, then yes, they will be able to get that calibre, uh, get that information, the same as the other people. They get to help us, obviously, which is our main goal, uh, but they also will get that information. All that will be recorded. You'll be emailed to let know what's going on. And whether there's updates in the middle or it's information at the end will really depend on our process and what's actually happening. But rest assured, we will give you as much as we can on that score. And that's while that calibre is listed. Once that calibre is taken off, It'll, it'll be replaced with a different calibre, cartridge, I should say, um, chambering. Um, once that's changed over, then that option, those options are gone. But while it's up there, which at this moment I can't tell you. I can't tell you if that's going to be one month of the process or that's going to be one year of the process. This is new uh, uncharted territory, so we're stepping into it to see it actually happens and see if we can make it work. Really looking forward to it. I think there's some really good options there. Um, another little hurdle that I banged into during that process was um, the, some of them, the likes of the 300 Norma, the likes of the um, 300, 378, whether it be Magnum, um, there's 416s, there's, there's all sorts of choices in the Lapua bolt head or Lapua bolt face cartridges. Um, what I've decided to do, I started with the process of making them a fair bit more expensive again, to try and pay for a action as well. I really decided that got convoluted and confusing and the moment I bought an action then it didn't need to be there. So people who started the process would have been paying more than people at the end of the process. So that was unfair. I didn't like the smell of that. Um, so I've decided that's just a $2,000 hit that we're gonna have to wear or probably really a, a $3,500 hit that we're gonna have to wear. Um, and I found a way to do that with a very strong action. Um, it will have few choices. Um, I'm probably going to default to the Barnard action. That's a simple um, action to do that sort of stuff with. Um, it, of course, if there's action makers out there that would like their action in that place, then you know, let us know, hit us up, whatever you want to say on that sort of score. Um, if there's good deals on that sort of stuff, we can make it happen. We have to keep in mind, and this is for anyone thinking about building a rifle, an action is not a simple decision in the way of strong and smooth and, and um, accurate people would talk about that sort of stuff. Yes, those are all relevant features, but actually what you're putting it in becomes a more relevant feature. So when you're looking at a stock and when you're looking at a chassis and all that sort of stuff, what you can actually get for that. I will probably be building my own stuff to do that and, and go with the, the Barnard. It's nice and simple. It's reasonably cost. Um, it's a very high quality action and it is and there's no blame in the action for anything in such a rigidly built thing, um, which is really my fundamental cause there, is that I want to make sure that I'm testing the cartridge as well as it can be, and not, not put in other excuses as to how it behaved or what the brass was like and that, because you've got an action that's flexing or anything like that, which is why I wouldn't use a 700, uh, the standard 700 action, but, uh, listen, there's still options there. Once we get the go on a, once we get enough support for one of those cartridges, one of those chamberings, um, then I will, like I said, that's largely our pocket um, that that'll be happening from, but I'll make that happen so we do it properly. And once we're done there, then we can try all the other Lapua cases if people want to go there as well. Lapua bolt face cases. Okay, so that's that little thing. That's the chambering. Listen, really look forward to the support with that. Really interested to see how it goes um, and really be great to test some of those cartridges in a fashion that we can 
that can make us afford to do it and try all those different things that people try. Um, we just got to get them enough, enough support from individuals to do that. Okay, enough talking about that one. I'll put these to the side. Next bit, what we got here, muzzle brakes. Now you've no doubt seen all our muzzle brakes um, previously um, on our web store and what we use all the time, our square muzzle brake, designed so that they um, have good port braking, they're very balanced, so they're dead straight, they don't force any up and down or any of that sort of stuff, left, right, up, down, that sort of stuff, it's all very smooth. Straight out of the side, they don't have as much blast to the ground, so there's, that's really why I designed them, so there's not as much dust thrown up when you're trying to shoot in the prone conditions, especially in our dusty environment. Um, and they've got a very pleasant side effect, so they're very good at keeping the percussion away from your face. So a lot of the ports, the, 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 um, a lot of the aggressive muzzle brakes you'll find do a lot of, give a lot of per percussion, especially in the big rounds, so it's like a little tap on the nose all the time. These don't. These are very good at protecting your face, I and mean, then I found them perform very well. And we get lots of very positive reviews from people who use them and go, wow, it's awesome, the rifle's so much nicer, um, all that sort of stuff, and, and, and maybe I should work out a way to put that on so people can read that stuff. Uh, but listen, that's our muzzle brakes. A couple of things I want to go through. One is, by a um, serviceman over in Iraq, he um, contacted us um, to say could, he was building a, a, I think it was a 338 um, snipe tack, so a pretty big hitter, and wanted a decent muzzle brake. Um, now I've built custom ones with angle back ports and wedge shape and all that sort of stuff for my really big stuff. Um, and listen, I'd love to find a way to put them on the market, but they are monstrously expensive. They're a three machine, three piece machine process, welded together, remachined, all that sort of stuff. So they become, um, for me to do myself and what I put into it, okay, it makes sense to try and sell them. Uh, they come up with silly prices. So they're not feasible, not with the machining processes we have on offer. So, um, but what I have done, these four ports work very well, um, very well. But going to the next level, there's the five port, uh, which is what we built here. It's bigger again, um, obviously, staged up in a few ways. It's a tiny bit wider than our normal four port. It's certainly longer than our four port, but otherwise the ports are the same. Um, they, we ran a slightly bigger bore to allow for the longer access, that sort of stuff. Uh, by, by the way, the bore doesn't do much difference. You don't need a super close fit to your bullet to get the same effectiveness out of it. Um, the gas comes out very quickly. And really the way the brake works is all the gas that hits this front face, that makes the big difference to the braking. The more pressure, more area it's got to take that whack of, that, of, that, um, of the gases coming out, the more retardation it does. Um, these ones here, and it brings into the conversation I'm going to have, are, are built with custom big threads. Um, I did them with, uh, one, there's a very small order, so they're a bit more expensive because it's a limited number order. Maybe if we sell lots of them that will change, but at the moment they're more expensive and the price will be listed on the website. But there's two threads I've done them in. <laughs> one was, which was for that order, which was one inch by 14 threads per inch. And I've also done it in one inch by 28 threads per, in per inch. Um, I think it's 28, it'll be on the website as to what they are. Um, that is, and I suppose that's the point I want to raise. If you're using these, you would be getting a, um, your, your barrel threaded to suit this. That sort of size, that's where we're going to, and that's really what you're always doing, this big stuff. Um, yes, we could do one-off orders, which um, go into, you know, probably a little bit more expensive again, to do different threads. But the main thing is the size of that thread, how big it is. And it raises a point for me, which I would like to reiterate. When you run a bigger brake, you want a bigger thread. What actually happens, the thread at the end of the muzzle is the point that takes the hammer shock of that gas going there. And yes, it's a full blown hammer shock. Take, take a, 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 I don't know, a three pound hammer and hit as hard as you can is the sort of whack that a muzzle brake is delivering. So as much as your barrel's made out of good chrome molly steel or a high, a high um, nickel um, chrome molly steel or that sort of stuff, where you're talking about the stainless barrels, that sort of stuff. And so they're good quality steel. Um, they still are just steel. And if you think about your muzzle, your barrel coming along and then it cuts down to a small piece where your muzzle brake thread's on, well that small piece right at the end of that, between the, the, the flange or the, 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 the biggest part of your barrel down just before the thread starts, right there, is getting pulled out. That's, that is actually getting stretched. Now, if you have it big enough, then it won't stretch. 
So, but it is still the weakest point in your barrel at that point, and it's dealing with a, a very aggressive part, as much as a lot of action happened down the chain to here. At the end, it's trying to pull the end off the barrel, and that's what works against the rifle going the other way, the recoil. So, when you do something small, I don't sell a lot of these, they're a funny little thing, but these little two ports can come down to where you've got a 14 millimeter thread. Um, the lift goes do that sort of stuff and there's even half inch threads but down to little tiny ones because there's not that much force out of the little break. Still a fair bit and I prefer to be, I'd really prefer to be the 5.8 by 24 sort of threads or the 15 mil that sort of stuff but you can come down smaller without too much risk. Once you go to the three port we do these in a small one again once again for the lift go um, because they do a few that have a thread that in my consideration is too small. But in moderate loads, that sort of stuff, it's still going to work fine, but it is definitely a weak point in the barrel. So I definitely the 5 8 by 24 um, the um, one by 18 sort of stuff is the common threads you'll run into. Um, and that's really a very much a desired sort of thread size, minimum thread size for the three port. Once we go to the four port, and that's where the conversation sort of really starts, I do do these four ports in the 5 8 by 24 but only because we've got so many requests and really it comes into a place which is where I would like to make the point. The 5.8x24 is a very, very common thread, but in my opinion, shouldn't be on a Magnum. So your 7mm rem mags, your 300 wind mags, your um, PRCs, your 300 PRCs, that sort of stuff, even, even the likes of the, um, well I suppose in the, in the short action magazines, the SORMs and that sort of stuff, yes, you'll get away with that smaller thread without trouble, but ideally, I would go a little bigger. Ideally, I would go into the, into the like the 1x18s is a, is a common one in the metric stuff, in the three quarter, that type of thing. And in the SORMs, listen, there's really no problems in that sort of power level. Um, but once you get into the bigger magnums, then really I'd be suggesting stepping up, whether that's the 1 and 18, which I use a lot, or it's the um, 28 by 3 quarter, 24 by 3 quarter sort of stuff, which we do them in there, but that's really where I'd go. But my real comment is, coming the 5 8 by 24 on a big magnum, it's pushing the boundaries. And I would suggest if you have the option to go up from that. Certainly, once you go to these big fellas here, then I'm going up. Really, three quarters would be the absolute minimum. Seven eighths is more close to ideal. And going to the likes of an inch um, is a far better option once you go into a lot of gas because you're dealing with not a, not a hammer blow anymore. You've got a sledgehammer blow, go, blow going up there. And that stretch, two things to keep in mind with that stretch on, that, on the actual thread on the end there. One is, it's a place where failures can actually happen. You can get cracks happening, especially with that machined edge. Nicer to have a radius, but a lot of them have a sharp edge where the thread comes up. Um, and they tend to have a little rebate just behind the thread of where the, the tip comes on for the, where the muzzle thread is. But you can do, they can get a crack, but the bigger deal is, if you think about it, is that although that thread's pulling out, on the inside is your rifling. And if your rifling is doing a little tiny wriggle, even if it's only a thou of actual stretch as the bullet goes through it, that's not ideal. So um, generally, yes, it's happened just after the bullet's gone through and generally it doesn't cause any issues and I really haven't seen any real issues from that thing. This is more an engineering thing of the, the logical side of engineering is this discussion. Anyway, finish of that one is that yes, we have now got five ports, they're on there, they're large shreds. Um, and so, um, yeah, if you're looking for that sort of stuff, we do those there. Okay, on to the next bit. Okay, what I've got in front of us is our, our trusty old mat um, and a new one. Now, it's not something I've always been considering. I've been, um, uh, I'll put this to the side a little bit. This is the one, or this is the, one of the ones that we've been using for a long, long time. Ridgeline mats, um, put it right around, the Ridgeline mat. Um, which we've used, they work really nicely. Um, we've made some little modifications to them. Um, the, I suppose to start off with, um, I would, no, I'll get, it, I'll get a different one. This is my one, it's a bit older and tattier. It's done sort of, I don't know how many years of, of hard work. Works really well, really like it. But I did have to do some modifications to it. I'll unwrap it so you can see what I'm talking about. The bits, I like about it, it's, it's built nicely, it wears well, great mat, really good. Um, but in understanding more about mats as I, as I learned over the years, I found there was a few things I wanted to do. 
One, different surfaces and things like that cause the, the um, I prefer to put the bipod legs in the ground, but um, they need to be close to contact, no bounce and that sort of stuff. But sometimes the ground is not very supportive, so actually putting them on this front flat worked really well. It's nice and thin, it doesn't, it doesn't cause any cushioning or anything like that, but it was, um, it worked like that. But the problem I found some trying to preload is that I couldn't. So we put this little strap on the front here, which the bipod legs can go in under, you've probably seen it on some of my videos, which meant that you can have traction. You don't want a lot of preload, you're not trying to bend the legs or off or anything like that or preload too much, it's one of the mistakes can happen when you set yourself up a, a good traction point, but it's just to be able to get the right amount, just gentle preload. And to stop them walking forward um, when you're trying to preload, put these straps on here to do that. So that worked really nice, but that was a mod I did to this. The other mod I did is, once again, learning over the years, this is a long time ago, I did this, as you can see all the wear, but this little bit of spring in the mat actually becomes an issue in some places. Um, a little bit by itself, not that it's too bad, but more when you're on grass or on sand or something like that that has a little bit of movement in itself. If you have this sort of insulation point where it's got this cushion to it, it ends up where the, but the bag, or your bag base as we use, has a bit of movement to it, a little bit of squish in it, which isn't ideal for precision shooting. So what I did was cut it open and pull all the foam out so it's just solid mat from top to bottom. So it means it's got a scruffiness about it that always has nagged me a little bit because I've cut this and then couldn't really stitch it back together with any of my equipment. So I put some tape on it, which worked quite well, but it's just a little scruffy and, and not ideal. So um, I haven't had any problems beyond that point, apart from that little naggy bit. Works really well, really like the mats and work really well. And I see a fair few people use them as well. So that's where we were. Then recently, come back to these two. Um, we found a company that does a lot of building stuff, they're pretty capable guys, which is up here in Perth, um, which I'll go through and share names and bits and pieces later on, but I found a company that was, um, we went and had a talk to about maybe building one. A little bit along the lines of keeping in mind that, that people might want to buy them, we sort of bang into that, we build something, we get questions, so we went into it with that sort of thought right from the get-go and got us to build us one to test. And we built one, we liked it, there's a few little mods to it. This is the second stage of it, which we're now gonna test and really run it for two or three or four months until we're really happy with everything and work out the quirks. But I thought I'd introduce it to you uh, so you can see it and watch what we're up to. To start with, rolled up. There it is, in a rolled up form, um, versus this other one in a rolled up form. Put two of these together, they're taking up a bit of room in the bag, especially when we both shoot. Then uh, in the back of the ute, they had taken a fair bit of real estate. Um, not terrible, but they too take a fair bit of real estate. In comparison, that's what this one rolls up like. And I'll put this one down so we can talk more about the one we've done. A couple of things at the moment, which I'm not sure about, um, is these big clasps and big handle and things like that. These are things that the guy up there, he does this, he does a lot of bags and bits and pieces. Um, and he got this stuff put together, got it made, um, so they're not too expensive in what they do, but it is very nice and thorough for what he does. My first glance of looking at it was, ah, a bit big and bulky, I'd prefer the smaller stuff and, and sit down so it sort of doesn't whack on things and it isn't bulky and it might get under your feet and da 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 da, including this handle sort of thing. But um, I thought we'd try it. And what I have to say is they work really nicely. They're a very simple system to, to latch and unlatch um, they also are very nice in the fashion, very easy to adjust. So you clip in really easy, you do it up tight. It's a nice small little bundle. So they work really well. And I really haven't seen any issues with using them. Apart from the fact if you're not careful, there's metal bits and pieces. So if you bash them against things, they're not as soft as a piece of plastic. They're really wearing well, they're not doing anything wrong. We've really been through all the dirt and the mud and the bits and pieces and bleh, this is what they look like. This has been tested quite a bit. So eh, I'm in two minds, but they look quite good. Um, the next bit of it, and why it rolls up so small, is there's no padding in this thing at all. This has got, and uh, it's, it's got a good polyurethane, I'd, I'll go through all the details um, at some stage, but this is basically between the two of us talking about it, came up with materials that should do the job. This, apart from the stitching, um, which is still a, a, a proper sealing sort of stitching, but still makes it not completely impervious, Apart from that, this plastic sort of coat, uh, polyurethane, whatever sort of coat, is completely waterproof. So no water comes up through this, 
with the other ones it would always come up a little bit when you're in really wet grass or really wet ground um, this doesn't this seals really nicely it also wipes off very easily stuff clings to it a little bit more because it has that sort of you know plastic sort of stuff where dust sticks to it but wipe it with your hand blow it with your with air that sort of stuff whatever it is it comes off very clean um, and as they wrap up, they wrap, they, they roll pretty much to themselves, so they look after themselves. And even if you were in really bad situation and really messy, you could just roll it up, clip it together, wipe off the outside, put it away, and then take it home and hose it down. It's proper canvas, all that sort of stuff. It's going to dry easily, you know, rather largely water impervious. So you're really quite easy to manage in the way of using it and, and putting it away and storing it and all that sort of stuff. Um, it is um, the, probably the way I've found it, as you can see, if you look on the face of this, we've been using it. There's dirty, dusty footprints all over that sort of stuff, stood on it, rolled around in it, you know, done all the bits and pieces, it's worked really well. It is quite rigid, um, and you see there's a little bit of rolling up on the edge here, um, which I find that because it is rolled up tight like this, I do have to just push them backwards a little bit, and they lay down, but lays down flat. Also, because it's, and I'll, I'll put the weight, I'll list the weight down below. I can't think of it in my head at the moment. It's not too heavy, but it is heavy enough where we don't have the flyaway problems. It's not trying to get blown away by quite heavy wind. Now, I'm not saying it's going to lay there still in a tornado, but it's pretty good. You know, it's a, just sort of heavy enough in its, in its, with low, um, high mass for low volume uh, means that it doesn't get blown around. It lays down quite well. And we don't have to put things on the end of it, which we used to have in the other one in the windy conditions. Um, it's deliberately flat enough and yet sturdy enough to where I've lain, uh, put it over fairly, you know, small rocks and bits and pieces. And it's strong enough that they're not a problem. You can lay on it comfortably and doesn't need the cushioning. But what that also means is that then I didn't need to cut anything out. The bag base sits on it, neat and tidy, sits on top of it without any rock or anything like that. So that was the main feature I was going for there. So I didn't have to modify to do that. And my design at the front of it, this is what I'm talking about where there's a little bit of coiling up. So I just um, push it over, there it is, backwards like that, sit it down, it lays down flat. Um, I think that'll always be the case. We'll try in the middle of winter, see how that goes, but that works quite nicely. And what I put on the front is this little bead. There's a little bit of rope in there, which gives it a tiny bit of a body. Um, but that is a little bead that then gives you a point where anywhere along here you can put the bipod legs to um, and you've got a point of traction without having to do anything else. So at the moment, um, listen, there's no knee pad areas or anything. It's all the same sort of canvas. It's all new age products made for um, all sorts of you know, outdoor stuff, made for, for um, tent floors and, and um, Backs are going to quality bags, bits and pieces, work bags, that sort of stuff is what these guys do. So this stuff is all super durable um, and we'll see. Um, oh, the last bit I'd say is we've just got a little beading on the outside edge here. Um, I was thinking more in the khaki greens or browns or things, but the black and the green, ah, it doesn't work too bad, you know, and it's, um, it's just sort of I'm getting pretty familiar with it and I like how it's working. So, listen, something that was designed out of just a little niggle I had with what is already a, someone else's very good product, and I still like that, but I really have been using this largely to test it, but found that the, the space saving, and I'll roll it up in front of you so you can see what we're talking about, nice and easy, no issues with that. Like I said, if you're wiping off in between, that's easy enough to do. I normally do this on the ground, not on a table. But... It's complex. I do a better job when I'm when I'm doing it by myself. But just click them in there, pull that up. Yeah, let's pull that one out a little bit. Roll it up, put away. Like I said, I normally roll up a little bit tighter than that. But even with um, for small hands, that can be harder. Uh, but even with it rolled up loosely, it's still a nice small unit. For us, we take two with us quite regularly. They take up the same room as one of the others. Um, and like I said, with the ease of these brackets, of these um, clamps, uh, I'm sort of thinking they might be a good idea anyway. But um, and I suppose if you've got suggestions and thoughts, let us know. It's not something we're looking at bringing to market for probably at least a couple of months. I want to test a bit more in the winter and that side of things. But I just thought I'd show what we're up to and for people to pay attention, what's going on? We're using a different mat. Anyway, that's 
Down there, that's a list of bits and pieces of what I'm up to today. Keep in mind with your muzzle threads and the, the we, we have all the options. We list all the stuff on the side of what we sell, but largely the heavier the hitter, the larger the threat. Um, it isn't just a screw on point. It is a strength factor. It is a thing that will build more consistency in how the rifle works by having that thread a little bigger. Um, without getting too carried away, but really a little bigger is a little better in my opinion in that place. Um, and I suppose the last bit I'd say in the muzzle brake side, muzzle brake side of things is that um, a bigger brake isn't a better brake. Um, <laughs> what I'm trying to say with that is um, you should keep, you should take the braking to where it works properly and not look for too much. If you do too much braking um, or too much recoil retardation in your brake, then that's, a, that's an aggressive way to control the rifle. And it tends, it's potential to cause other issues. So obviously you need the right amount of brake and you want it to shoot well, but for accuracy, it's nicer to control recoil with the weight and the setup of the rifle and use the muzzle brake as a top up. If you take the weight of the rifle down and everything down, then run a big brake to compensate for things, the, there is, although that can work, there is the likelihood of, a, of, a, of an extra reaction actually happening because the brake is doing so much. And that can cause shooting form issues and accuracy issues because there's an extra wriggle happening because of a super efficient brake on a rifle that isn't otherwise really set up as well as it could be. So there's obviously different courses or different horses for different courses, that sort of stuff, and you've got to take it all in context. But largely, I tend to try to not overdo the brake um, for what I'm trying to do. Even though they look big, they're big and bulky and sideways, that's more about the keeping the dust off the ground as much as possible. Um, and I try and keep a balance in the brake versus the weight versus the rifle versus the cartridge. That's that one. And... Um, I'll finish off on the cartridge, on the, on the cartridge developments, that sort of stuff. Really looking forward to help with that sort of stuff. I would like to build all sorts of cartridges. We've got a very good gunsmith, as much as I am one, he does the chambering and that, the, the real gunsmithing stuff, um, which is, that's Brett Thompson. Um, he's over at his gunsmithing and listen, does a really good job, really, really on board with helping us out and trying to do things as cost effectively for us and as quickly for us as possible. So we're not waiting for that sort of stuff. So it means that once we've got a barrel, we can really make things happen. Um, and I'm really keen to put the work in and, and or myself and Sam, really keen to put the work in and test these things and show them off doing their best um, and share the information that we can with the, the, the extra information with the people that help us with that. So really looking forward to that. I hope it works. Um, other than that, guys, um, I think I'll sign off with that. That's a pretty long video. Thanks for checking in on us, and we'll catch you next time.